Hello, you're listening to me and Paranormal You with your host, Ryan Singer. Because it's more fun to believe. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to another experience of me and Paranormal You. This is your host, Ryan Singer. I I think, I mean, I guess I've been doing this show for eight and a half years so if you've been listening to this program, I, I don't know. I, I guess it's still proper show etiquette to introduce myself at the beginning of every program, just in case someone is listening for the very first time. If you are listening to the very first time for this show, if you're listening to this show for the very first time, boy, do do we have a treat for you. Because returning to the program, gosh, I'm looking, it has been... 12, 11, 20 was the date of the recording, I believe. It doesn't seem yeah. like it's been that long. Uh, but we've got returning to the program triumphantly, Dash Kwiatkowski. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for having me. I always do I always do the same thing on my podcast where there's like because I, I think we both I think we both have podcasts that are very much like you know, we're talking to the people who we're talking to and we, we sort of we, we have a, an idea what it is. And I always have this moment where I'm like, ah, this would be a weird one for someone's first one. Huh? Like I have to assume <laughs> I have to assume that it could be that it could be someone's first one. And I'm always like, all right, well, you 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 picked a you did pick one. You did pick one to start. Yeah. And maybe yeah. this is it. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we should be doing episodes where like the, the music or whatever stops. And then the first words, the people here are like, so remember last week when I was telling you that <laughs> death isn't real and that I went through a portal. Well, breaking news, you know, people are just like, what? I have read, uh, you know, every once in a while I, I do housekeeping or whatever and see, and I, yeah. I did notice one time somebody these, I, there's a, you know, the fact that there's podcasts about podcasts now is so sure, amazing yeah. to me. But uh-huh. uh, people, you know, saying like, I don't know what this guy is talking about. <laughs> it's not comedy and it's not paranormal. So <laughs> what I don't understand. And I'm just like, you nailed it, bro. You nailed it. <laughs> um, but we've got a lot to talk about since our last oh, conversation. Yeah. We um, I I you know what I need? I need to set a specific chime or sound for the dash text message because <laughs> because whenever the dash text comes in it's gonna be it's usually i mean obviously every once in a while it's just a hey how you doing hey but, how's it going yeah but but <laughs> at least 50 percent of the time it's a you're not gonna believe this yeah, you're not gonna believe this crazy shit that just happened. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. Uh. So this one, we could talk. Uh, yeah. We we could start with that. The this this most recent, uh, texting you. I had this thing happen, where, a bell, just shows up in the middle of my floor. And I'm like, I gotta. Uh, you're like the first person. I was like, I gotta. I gotta. T- <laughs> I gotta text Ryan about this. <laughs> like, you're, uh, yeah. So the bell just shows up. And I uh, and at first I'm just like, ah, came up out of the floorboards, you know, during a cleaning with a little vacuum or whatever, little vacuum robot came up out of the floorboards. Easy. No problem. Because the rooms all have like a divider. So each room like, you know what I mean? Each room has like a little bump. So like, you know, if we're going to vacuum, you got to put the thing in the in the different room. So it's like had to come from this room, had to come from between the floor. And I was like, all right, that's kind of fun. It's a bell. It's whatever. But then I take I'm like, I'm thinking about it and I'm like, hmm, let me let me test this. And I pick this bell up and I try each floorboard, like each crack, baseboard crack, floorboard crack. And it is way too big to fit in any of them. And not even by like not even by, you know, like, oh, it's almost there. Like it's like twice the size of any of the cracks. And I'm like, that's that's that is more just seems like this thing just kind of showed up. Um, and that's something like, that's, that's, that's cool. That's spooky. Uh, I'm thinking about, bell. it's like a playful bell. It almost feels like the bell off of like a jester's hat or a cat toy or something. So it's, you know, it's got like all the sort of all the, 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 the sort of cultural context that I would hold this bell in is very like playful, fun. Um, 
and also, you know, I'm thinking about bells in terms of, you know, cleansing and, and, and energy and stuff like that. Um, and so I post about it and so immediately someone's like, that's from, that's from fairies. You gotta, Hey, you gotta take that bell and take it into the woods and bury it. And then say, I do not accept your deal. And I was like, yeah, for sure. I'm not gonna do that. Um, because that's wild. I won't eat it though. So don't, you know, don't, don't stress too hard. That's so funny. About that. Uh, but yeah, no, so I got this, I got this bell. And so the, the other, the, the thing and the thing that you put together and I was thinking about too, is that, so the show that we went and shot since the last time I came and talked to you on here, uh, we shot a pilot, we shot a paranormal investigation pilot, really happy with how, uh, it's turning out. There've been some, some drags in editing. Um, but that's all sort of, that's all moving now. Uh, but the the being that we went to look into was the Bell Witch. And obviously, you know, that's from the name, the Bell family, the Bell Farm. But still, just the, that little, that little, that little sink. You know what I mean? Like that little connection of like, Bell Witch, here's a bell. I turned it into, I turned it into jewelry immediately. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the pictures of that. I did. Actually, well, let, me, let me grab it. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, what's interesting, too, about this while you're grabbing that, I'll, I'll kind of just yeah. expound like, you said being too, which I, which I really enjoy because of the so many different meanings, like being somewhere or there is a being or we yeah. are all just being. Um, also, so let's see this, the jewelry. Yeah. So um, I, I made basically I used armature wire and I made so this kind of goes sant and it also goes front and back. So I made a little I made a little like little loop that goes around the bell itself. And I, I glued that in and then I made a little coil so that I can pretty easily, like if I want to wear it as a charm on a bracelet or if I want to wear it as a charm on a necklace. So it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to take on and off. But it just felt it just felt like uh, it just felt right to put it on something that I can like carry with me. Like that was like first instinct. And I was very much like, all right, I'm going to follow this instinct. I'm going to put it on a wearable thing. That's really cool. One of the interesting parts of the you know the the reaction i guess of posting yeah uh this online is that's from fairies you have to bury in the woods uh tell them you are not accepting their deal now i want to talk about that a little bit if we can just yeah, I, I don't know course. a ton about this uh, i guess i don't know a ton about deal making um sure and the contracts the unspoken contracts that people maybe enter into almost as if it's like predatory l lending you hear about that and like you know <laughs> yeah. like when you come down to this car lot we approve anybody well because they know they're going to repossess the car in six totally. months and get a little money out of you in the meantime because they know you can't afford it but which is so which is one of the weirdest business practices by the way like just i, oh, yeah. I know a friend of mine not that long ago had their car repossessed and they show up in the middle of the night, like at four yeah. in the morning and just come quote unquote, like legally steal your car. It, it's just yeah. such a wild thing that we're just all like, this is what happens. This is yeah, this that's is just, normal. That's just the rules. Yeah. So. That's just the rules. But, um, so I, I, I'm curious about, first of all, we have to accept that these things are real and these contracts right. happen and things like that. But what I'm curious about is the idea that you can enter into a contract with a being, an elemental or an entity of some kind, without even really knowing it. And does that deal become, I guess, quote unquote, binding for a person? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what, have you looked into this? Or are you familiar with this concept at all? Yeah, so I've been reading, um, I've been reading some, but it's, it's actually funny that uh, the, the day the bell showed up, was the day the first day I picked up this book that I had been I had started a long time ago and then I was like I should I should finish this it's a it's a book about just sort of the folklore on the fae and fairies and sort of where a lot of that folklore comes from um, and I've read um, I've read there's a book called Secret Commonwealth um, that uh, that I read a while ago it's like a very very old book really really interesting um, just sort of into the lore of it and I think. 
one of the things that I find the most interesting about just sort of the the space that Fay occupy, sort of culturally speaking, is in a lot of it they are just sort of this like this catch all this catch all explainer for anything weird that's happening. You could say like, oh well, the Fay are doing that, you know. And I think. I think a lot of the a lot of the bargain stuff seems very tied to the like the don't eat the food. I don't know how much you've heard about people saying like, oh, you know, if you find food in the woods, don't eat it because that's how they get you. That's how they, they take you to the fairy realm and that's how they sort of turn you into a fairy sometimes or they they sort of they trap you. And I always like to think about, you know, what are the sort of what are the cultural origins of a of a thing like that? So, you know, don't eat food you find in the woods even for non-magical reasons is probably just, <laughs> just so- solid advice. <laughs> I think. Um, and you know, so I, I, I get, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff like that where I'm like, okay, why, you know, why would you not want to even, even look at like religious rules? Like why wouldn't you eat this type of food? Like, Oh, it's probably cause at that time, that type of food was like a lot harder to eat in a sanitary way, you know, stuff like that. Um, so don't eat the food in the woods makes sense, but I, I it, it gets into this idea of bargains and deals. And one of the things about about sort of fairies and lore is like their culture and their understanding is so radically different than ours that we are accepting deals or bargains that are sort of held by fairy law or fairy culture. And that's how we don't know where you know what I mean? So it's like that's how we don't know that we're, you know, taking a bad deal. And I think it's really interesting thinking about how like it's almost this like, uh, you know, the whole sort of like every accusation, a confession, right? When you think about how the indigenous people here in America were sort of taken advantage of because people showed up and were like, well, these are our rules. And so when you when you agree to this thing, you're agreeing to our rules. And like we, you know, we sort of uh, 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 in, in in colonial sense, like really just applied our stuff to everyone. You know what I mean? And so I, I almost I almost wonder if the the sort of the fear of the fairy bargain comes from this like this deep down fear of something more powerful doing that to us. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. The you know when you look at the this is like really the fascinating, this is why one of the reasons I love having conversations with you because it does like, you know, it reminds me that, you know, the, the reasons on the surface for something can be totally different, at least in words than, than the actual practical deep hidden meaning for why, there is a rule about something or a saying to avoid or to try to do. And, and oftentimes throwing on a mystical or a supernatural uh, or a paranormal layer to something also makes it transcend through time in a way that yeah. it becomes very interesting as well as very practical. Not to say that all, you know, folklore is, just you know telling people to wash their hands after they take a oh, shit no. where they eat <laughs> certainly, but, uh, <laughs> certainly not yeah uh, but it's um but that it is interesting too to try to understand the best we can which i'm not even sure it's necessarily possible at least from my point of view to like i mean because there's really no way to understand the rules and the laws of right. a i guess we'll say foreign culture that you're operating in all of the sudden yeah without having exposure to them previously right i mean there's just no uh, there's just unless you're like so deeply psychic you can just walk into a place and just understand <laughs> yeah. the rules of a room right like going into a poker room where you're not allowed where you've never played poker before and you don't realize you're not allowed to take your cards off the table or totally things like that but um so that is that is interesting so i i I guess the in this book, I'm curious if they have explanations and or I'm guessing it wasn't like a, you know, a fairy deals for dummies. Uh, no, but. yeah, <laughs> nothing. Well, so but that's that's sort of the interesting thing to me is so much of it is this like don't even engage like so much of the advice is just like never do a deal, never agree to a deal. And I think that's what that's what really interests me, because I think about I think about um 
you know, I think about fairies conceptually and sort of the the the, the place that they occupy, the idea of the fae. Um, there's so much connected to various types of of marginalization that are really really and i mean obviously beyond beyond the simple you know fairy as a as a slur or a, a a pejorative way of talking about you know gay people which is i feel like less common these days than it was you know however many years ago but i it's still there there's still the sort of the the connection and i i even think about like the changeling myths the change the idea of a changeling uh you know the myth that someday your child uh is replaced by some being that acts really different and you have trouble communicating with it. And a lot of the changeling myth, a lot of the people that got accused of being changelings were neurodivergent kids who, you know, their parents would be like, Oh, when they were little, they were totally different. And a lot of that is, you know, parents project a lot onto babies that don't, you know, communicate like adults because they're babies. And then when a kid grows up a little bit and they act in a way that the parent doesn't understand because, you know, understanding of, you know, neurodivergence is very uh, low even now, uh, sort of culturally. They're like, oh, uh, the fae must have replaced my child. And so I think of a lot about how much like, you know, I, I've I've felt for a while and a lot of this is sort of, I th- and I think we, we talked about this a little bit on the show last time, but a lot of the sort of the premise of the of the show of the of my uh, investigation show that I went out and shot is this idea of sort of kinship of, of uh, marginalized kinship with with the other with with the paranormal with the the you know ultra terrestrial with 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 everything sort of outside of what dominant uh, culture tells you is normal or or regular and so when I think about I think that's one of the things and maybe this is maybe this is hubris on my part. And I, I wouldn't be surprised by that because I've, I've been accused of hubris before, but uh, there's, <laughs> there, there's something to this, like this blanket fear of like, you can't talk to fairies. You can't enter into a deal with fairies. You can't engage with fairies at all. That, you know, sort of reminds me of like, Oh, if my, if my kid hears that gay people or trans people exist, they're going to get societally turned into one. Do you know what I mean? Like this fear of if you talk to the if you talk to the the dangerous other the dangerous other somehow it'll it'll uh it'll infect you with with its otherness and so you know when i when i get a little bell that just seems to apparate out of nothing and it feels very like it feels very fey it feels very other to me that's not, you know, that's less scary and more just like, oh, this feels cool. This feels like this feels like a connection. This feels like a validation of sort of how I think about all this stuff to begin with. Yeah, that is really cool. And it makes me curious. And there is, it is funny. I mean, earlier you, you mentioned, you know, you kind of like to the point where like the Faye got blamed for everything almost. Right. And it was like, it almost reminds me of thanks Obama, you know, totally. Thanks Faye. (laughs) Uh, And then, but so when you have like through, through a very long period of time, you have a collection of individuals who aren't necessarily connected to one another through the physical space, but are connected to each other through experience and yeah. through the marginalization of you know of who they who they are it it it's it's it, it kind of also reminds me of like goldblum and jurassic park where like he's, life will find a way right it's like totally. it's like yeah. community culture and existence will find a way right and so it is a really big thought and a really fascinating uh, train uh, that runs through this thought that this whole cult, this whole like folklore culture of of this other could be born out of a necessity for making sure these stories got passed on, even though yeah. the dominant culture said we will not give oxygen for this to be in the room. Absolutely, and so absolutely the most they could tolerate was was the the telling of a 
of a fanciful story of a of a creature that's mythical or you know what i mean totally. like it, like in that way it, it almost makes you wonder if these stories of these like you know trolls and fae and other creatures that seem to be from places unknown and unexplainable yeah. aren't just totally interchangeable with oh someone who is gay or yeah, who doesn't totally. identify with the cultural standards of what gender and so it just yeah. makes oh, wow. i mean that's a really that's a really interesting and i feel like that is like a whole college course uh, <laughs> yeah. program on trying to dive deep into all of that literature and well, it, everything else uh, and and so much of it too and i you know i think a lot of i think a, a lot of um a lot of i see this in sort of in in white queer circles who sort of point to and use these examples as like just to like use people and i, I don't i don't basically what i'm saying is i don't want to like point to specific cultures and be like see here 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 but around the world um you know out outside of outside of sort of uh Western colonialism, there are cultures from all around the world who, you know, didn't didn't conceive of gender as binary, didn't conceive of these things as 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 uh, set in stone in the way that uh, Western culture does. And even on top of that, though, would say like, oh, this person, this is uh, a, a third or fourth gender. And by just by being that third or fourth gender, that person is sort of selected for a shamanic position or for a spiritual advising position and pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's in, in the cultures that were, you know, outside of, were outside of, um, you know, again, that, that sort of that Western gender binary for those cultures, a lot of times people who were, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's hard. Cause you want to say, you want to, I, I, I find myself in a place where I don't want to say a trans person, because that's um, idiosyncratic, right? So that's not, not an idiosyncratic, that's uh, anachronistic is the word I was looking for. That's anachronistic because, you know, trans refers to a very specific type of experience. But people who were outside of that binary were often, in, in a lot of cultures, treated as mystical. And so that, I think, even goes to your point of, like, if not, if not a direct allegory or representation of queerness or existing outside of some frame that 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 culture sort of decided uh was what was you know normal or status quo uh still even like a conduit to it which i i think is is really really fascinating for me um as i sort of as i you know fall deeper and deeper into into the the weird stuff that i find myself falling <laughs> into <laughs> uh well let's uh pick up this thought yeah uh, after a, a quick a quick break here. Okay, and we're back. So, I mean, what this conversation has turned into, and which I anticipated without knowing the specifics, was a <laughs> you know a grand conversation that bridges so many different things that brings the paranormal into uh, you know the the deeply personal. And yeah. also the cultural implications and the the mirroring effect and the connections and the companionship we can find within stories and with each other through stories, et cetera. And it is so hard. And I, and I say I say this from a very specific position of, you know, of who I grew up as and where I grew up and things like that totally. to try to keep all of these, like the big things. And, and I don't think anyone expects any of us at any given time to even be doing this, but um, to try to, you know, be mindful, the mindfulness, right. Of yeah. trying to understand some of these really big issues that are transformative and in fact should be transformative on culture here in the west yeah um you know to be mindful of all of that and to understand the history and 
the origins of so many things is no one expects us to all have that all together, oh, have our shit together all the time. <laughs> and I think that is sometimes when you find like, you know, maybe pushback from like the, the majority of culture, which I think at the end of the day, if they were, if everyone was truly honest with themselves, the majority is not exactly what everyone thinks it is. Totally. I super agree with that. And the beautiful thing about the paranormal and the mystical and, and folklore and all these tales as well is not only do I believe that so many of them are rooted in actual events yeah. and and truth and understanding that the world and the universe is so much more than what we think um, or what we've been taught is, yeah. I mean, because we have been taught in a very binary way about everything. Like there's, Absolutely. there's, you're, you're, you're alive you're dead, right? So it makes it makes great sense to me when you're talking about the people who are operating outside of, you know, that standard binary notion of of gender and other things, that these people are looked at as, you know, mystical or I don't want to say they've ascended or evolved right. past it necessarily, but they're obviously operating in the liminality. Yeah. Uh which when examined from like a telescope from far, far away, you realize, oh, that liminal space, which we talked about in the first. And it, by the way, if you're listening, it's experience 333, which is such a great number. Um, great number. If you want to listen to Dash and I's first conversation, which I highly recommend. But so it makes sense that, you know, operating outside of that stringent binary gives a person access to more. Uh, and, and I guess different as compared to the point of view from the person who's, who's operating within that binary. And I, I think that, I think that's so much of, and it's, it's funny because I feel like, I feel like the more I think about this stuff in terms of the paranormal, which I, I fully agree with you that, so I, I think what I, what I sort of, I, I break it down to is I, I, tr I genuinely, tr people ask like, oh, do you believe in Bigfoot? Do you believe in UFOs? Do you believe in all this stuff? And the answer is, I don't know. I, I, well, the thing that I believe in, that I, I really truly believe in is that existence and the world and everything that we're sort of doing here is bigger and more magical than maybe even can be measured um, in, an, in terms of hard practical science or whatever i i you know i i really the thing that i believe if i have to narrow down like what do you believe in i just believe that i i think there's magic out there and i don't know what it looks like and i don't know what shapes it takes but it's so much even just even just you know it's just it's just so much more interesting. I, I get so confused by people who are like, there's only it's hard science and that's it. And it's like, that's a, that's a wild, that's a wild uh, thing to want so hard to commit to. Anyway, all that aside. Uh, um, I just see the these people I, with like, uh, as being young teenagers with posters of numbers on their wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is my, this is my, this is my favorite. This is my favorite microscope. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, but like, but like, you know, the more the more I get into this, I think what you said about not not evolving beyond, but being different. I think that's that's where the key is, and and I think that's that's how I've been trying to expand my you know my life, both paranormal and uh, normal. Not that any of us are living a normal life at this point, but outside of the you know outside of the the realm of, of magic and and stuff like that, where like. I think about, and I do this a, a lot with, um, with social media, but I think about like, all right, I try to live as radical an existence as I can. I try to, when I have resources, I try to redistribute them to, you know, the people who need it most. Like I've got a, you know, ongoing donation for a couple of on, uh, abortion networks and a couple of, uh, trans funds that I try to, you know, mutual aid, mutual aid and community, in my opinion, if anything's going to save us, I don't think, I don't think a political party is going to save us. I don't think a lot of, I think community and mutual aid are the things that are going to save us. And by us, I mean people. So I, I try to do that as much as I can, but I, I'm constantly trying to be like, all right, who are some voices that I don't really have? What's information that it's not in my, you know, in my circles, in my spheres. And I, uh, a bunch of years ago, I was like, Hey, you know what? I don't really know what, I don't really know what radical 
um, Native Americans are are saying right now. And I feel ignorant about this. So I just, you know, I go on Twitter and I say, let me follow some people. Let me follow some authors. Let me follow some people who are saying things that I don't know. And then it's any group. I'm thinking like, oh, uh, I'm seeing some people talk about, uh, please don't go to Hawaii. And I'm like, I would love to understand that. And so I follow some people on Twitter. And so I've been doing this thing where I, it's, it's not about, it's not about me saying like, I'm going to put my nose in every book and understand everything. But it is about me saying like, I, I feel ignorant about specific topics. I feel ignorant about specific people and specific groups and what they're going through and what, you know, what activists in these communities are saying. So I luckily I have this this very bad app called Twitter on my phone <laughs> that but it but it's but it's crazy because, it you know, it, yeah, it's a bad app and I, I don't like it. But as long as I'm on it, which I will continue to be, unfortunately, I, I want to use it to say, like, let me widen, let me widen my understanding of people, of people who, you know, people who don't have a platform because of the way culture has sort of structured, uh, been structured. And I say, okay, well, let me, let me listen to some people. And it's, it's been really cool. And, and I feel like, but I feel like that's going to what you were saying about like, um, you know, people of a different gender experience or gender expression are going to have a different way of looking both at the paranormal and just at the world. And so I think that the, the paranormal is no different than that. You know, I like people are going to understand thing, you know, people are going to have like, oh, this thing happened. And that reminds me of a very specific folklore from my culture. Let me share it with you. Or this reminds me of a specific experience that I've had in the world. And the I think if, if we're going to try to paint some sort of full picture of mundane things or magical things, having the sort of the breadth of experience around it, having a bunch of different people with a ton of different lived experience is at least the most interesting way to do it to me. Wow. I mean, that's beautifully said, I think. And there's, there's so much beauty and so much wonder in the world yeah. that, that exists, that walks side by side with, you know, the darkness and the tragedy of the world as well. And, you know, it, it reminds me of uh, an Avid Brothers song where, uh, what is it? Is it? the dark and the light or and it's a song about death and life or something I can't, I can't remember but how they live together they're like this couple yeah and anyway and, and they're in love with each other so and there is like so much to learn and so much to be excited about when it comes to trying to understand newness or the other and i and i think that's probably at the heart of what so many people who are invested in and love the paranormal. Absolutely. There's a curiosity about the thing that is different than us. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, you, you strike a really resonant chord there because what people, and it's, I think, you and I both can agree that it's definitely this way in comedy where, you know, yeah. for, for years, Comedy Central made the general population believe that stand-up comedy was a certain thing. Totally. Absolutely. And when in fact it was so much more than that. And I believe, you know, the Travel Channel and Discovery or whatever, they've made people believe that investigating the paranormal is a very specific <laughs> thing. Absolutely, and, yeah. And that very specific thing is a bunch of like, you know, <laughs> tough white guys going into a place yeah, talking shit like to a ghosts. New metal band, yeah. Exactly. And and it is so much, so much more than that. And I think the world will come to understand that. And yeah. It's, it's really funny because there's this great TED talk uh, by a guy, Kevin Kelly. And I, I, I watched it years ago. And it was, I think the title of it is called Evolution Towards, uh, Tends Towards Specialization. Yeah. And he argued that through the process of evolution, that everything is affected by. Yeah everything becomes more specialized and we can see that in comedy. We can see it in music. Um, you know, it used to be stand up comedy. Now there's alt comedy and now there's blah, 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 blah. Right. And it's just such a beautiful 
concept to try to understand like, oh, okay, so everything becomes more specialized yeah. and more unique and breaks off into its own thing and becomes its own life. I mean, I guess that's what offspring even yeah is right um so to think that that's happening clearly it's happening in in the world of our understanding of what paranormal is and you know the investigation techniques that go along with it i'm curious about the without getting into too many details about the the pilot you shot and the project yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that you're working on if there is a specific um because you know you and I are the same. And, and I think in this way that, you yeah. know, you know, going into a paranormal project is it's about so much more than just like, let's capture evidence on camera. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So like a, a th not a theme necessarily, but like the, the perp, like the purpose that goes behind, that's the, the foundation, the, you know, of, of the investigation itself. And I believe we've probably touched on a little bit of it already, but I, I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I try to like, in, in terms of just like investigative methods, I, I really like the, uh, the Estes method. Uh, I think everyone likes it right now. Uh, you know, pioneered by Connor and Carl from the, you know, who are on the Hellier crew. Um, and I will say just, and this is me being petty. I am finding a lot of, a lot of sort of, it's very funny watching. Cause you know, a lot, like you said, a lot of the, a lot of the ghost shows on the discovery and the travel are, a certain way and i realize that and i do watch a lot of them and it's been very funny watching each of them try to sort of introduce this method as if they've created it which is very funny to me just in terms of a like oh yeah we're doing this thing where and this is how it works and it's like you could you could cite you could do a little work cited that's fine yeah um <laughs> yeah i mean but, give credit uh, where credit's due i mean it's like no one's gonna be no one's gonna be like uh, what like, yeah, exactly. You know, you're using a technique you didn't think of right then on the spot or yeah, you developed. Yeah, yeah it's it, yeah. <laughs> uh, but so I, I really like that. I really like that method. Just and I think there's something about, you know, and I uh, about I've, I've definitely there's a there's a little hill in, in town that I, I, I take friends to sometimes on Wednesday nights uh, to sort of participate in the, the WUFO Wednesdays that the, the Liminal Earth people do where we'll just go up and we'll, you know, we'll look at some stars and we'll, we'll do our best to, you know, we'll do some tarot polls and we'll you do some Estes stuff and just, you know, kind of see what wants to talk back. Um, it's always, always a lot of fun. Um, so I, I love the Estes method. I think it feels like a very personal and a very sort of like uh, a very specific way to sort of have one person sort of act as a conduit or a connecting piece to that. So I, I, I think that's sort of my number one, just in terms of, in terms of, specific uh specific methodologies in terms of the in terms of like the the general thought process behind it actually that that one's really interesting in just thinking about like how the show started out and so again i don't want to you know for spoilers i'm not going to get into too many specifics but um you know we started we started out you know we're, we're going to look for the bell witch and we started out in the sort of the Adams Museum doing what I would say sort of felt like a much more traditional, like we're going to talk to whatever's here. And the results that we got, which were, were pretty, pretty direct. And I definitely, I had my first, um, <laughs> I had my first sort of very uh, scary is a weird way to describe it because scary feels like I, I fear for my safety. And I, at no point did I fear for my safety during this, but I had my first like very present, very negative experience with something sort of um, that felt metaphysical or, or, or extra normal. And it felt as we were sort of reaching out and, and what felt like a sort of a traditional, a traditional, ghost exploratory way, I sort of realized that what we were doing was, you know, if, if the sort of the premise and the, and the thought behind my show is to give a voice to the voiceless and to platform the, the unplatformed, what we were doing wasn't that we were sort of exploring the lore as it exists, the story as it is told by the sort of the storytellers who have recorded the history and it felt like we were just sort of participating in something that already existed. And it felt like we were participating in something very human and very uh, straight and very like recorded history. 
And so we sort of had to pivot um, when we're making the show. We sort of had to pivot into like, okay, well, let's let's kind of do it a different way then, because I don't I don't know if this is I don't know if this is the ghost show that I want to make. I don't know if this is the spooky show that I want to do. Is you know I don't want to just do another show where we talk to the same you know the same sorts of things that everyone's talking to. And so we really dug deep into like, let's talk to some people. Let's talk to some local people here in Tennessee who are queer and trans and people of color who practice magic, who read tarot, who do spells and sort of let's get, let's try to get a handle on queer Southern magic and just kind of see what that looks like. And as the more we did that, the more we found ourselves getting into nature and just sort of, you know, still doing the Estes, still doing tarot, things like that, but really, really looking for signs and synchronicities and things that would sort of present themselves to us that we could follow. And I think that felt a lot more genuine to me. That felt a lot more like, it felt a lot more like, it felt less like scrambling around with flashlights in the dark and more like, finding breadcrumbs to follow that are leading us towards, you know, who knows what. Um, so I would say, you know, the, the sort of the general, the general attitude of the show, and this will, this will be true moving forward in, in other episodes too, is that, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to find a house with doors that slam. I mean, that'd be cool. I would love to find a house with doors that slam <laughs> shut on their own for sure. But I'm not, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to set up a bunch of nanny cams and say like, all right, we're going to sit and then we're going to do an exorcism where I, I don't intend. And you know, uh, uh, I, I, I'm sure I could be proven wrong. I, I, I do not believe that we will bring in a priest to do an exorcism at any point on, the, on this show moving forward. Um, you know, I, I, I think our general methodology and our general sort of idea behind discovering that methodology is like, let's just kind of try stuff. Let's see what happens. Let's see what people tell us. Let's, you know, not again, spoilers, but let's let's get an oracle reading from someone we interview that sets us down a incredible path of synchronicities leading to a magic spell that leads us to encountering a. Uh, some really, really scary wildlife that acts in a way that wildlife doesn't act uh, and sort of, and see where that takes us. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Is that, I don't know if that's an answer. To no, the it question. does. I think it does make sense. And there's, there's something beautiful about using something that's uh, like a tool. Cause yeah. I, I would, I would argue that, you know, whether it's the Estes method or dowsing rods or tarot yeah. cards or spirit boxes, any of that stuff, these are tools. Uh, these are communication devices, um, you know, ways to try to communicate using and in, in finding new ways to use things that aren't even that old, especially when it comes yeah. to the essays. And that does that does get me a little pickled up when, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, they really, you know, they really had something interesting. And, you know, especially that hell your crew did something to the paranormal yeah. world that the paranormal world wasn't necessarily i guess ready for and, and so much of Absolutely. it can be attributed to to carl's brilliance with editing and Absolutely. filmmaking um and you know which yeah, i think is the the underpin of all of that of the success of hellier it's just so Definitely. beautiful and easy to watch with in the music is also uh, the person they have doing the original music is incredible the um but yeah so it's finding new ways to do the big work, which is yeah. opening up the line of communication to the magic of the universe that we live in and trying to get yeah. closer to the source of what it is we're even doing here or what we are. Um, and to me, that's the exciting, the really exciting part. And now will people find it entertaining to watch on television on a Thursday night at nine 30? <laughs> Some of the stuff that I think you and I want to be showing that's up. That's for them to decide. Right. And yeah. that's for executives to decide because there's not enough <laughs> doors slamming in this 30 minute episode or right. screaming or what the fuck was that? You know, yeah. there's not enough of that happening to, uh, you know, sell, to sell soap and food and beer or whatever <laughs> during the commercial breaks. But at the end of the day, 
I think this is the important stuff. And I don't want to sound too, you know, I've also been accused of having hubris. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, I don't want to make it sound too like self-important, but I do think it is important to try to put this out there. And specifically from your point of view, you know, you can do something that I could never do just be, do by nature of your life experience and who you are and who I am. And it doesn't mean it's better or worse, or it's just of different. Course, yeah. It's just different. And I think that's what's so cool about this is the, the idea that more and more people can see, can hear, can experience something familiar to them. Right. Which yeah. I think is one of the huge things about feeling included and, and yeah, feeling right. part of part of the whole team that we all are as people. Right. And, you know, it was very easy for me to want to be a stand up comedian when I was a kid because I saw a lot of guys that looked like my family or what I thought I would look like when I grew yeah. up. And, totally. um, I was like, oh, I can do that. And you, you hear all these great stories about, you know, kids nowadays being like, oh, I saw someone who looked like me on television doing this. And I yeah. thought I could do this. And it is very important. And, and there's no different when it comes to the paranormal. I just, I just read a book and it's got a slur in the title. So I'm not going to, even if it's my slur to say, I'm not going to say it out loud. Um, but it's the it's the it's the it's called the F words and their friends in between revolutions. And it's the F word that's not fuck. It's the the slur one. Um, but it's a really it's a really radical and magical book that sort of uh, it's framed like a fairy tale sort of. It's framed like a fairy tale. There's actually a there's a there's a passage in it, and it's sort of it, it, about about the F words and the fairies. Uh, getting together and dancing and I found that very meaningful just for in my whole study you know thinking as a, as a queer person who's talking about the fae and fairies and stuff but one of the the things that uh the thing that sort of brought this up to me which oh, by the way highly recommend the book there's a newish edition that just got printed that has a really powerful forward that talks about the author and the sort of the the queer commune that the author was participating in this place called Lavender Hill. That was like right outside of Ithaca, New York. That was just like really beautiful and incredible. And this was, this was in the seventies and they were playing around with neo pronouns. So not using he or she for anyone using different pronouns that they had invented, playing around with using MX instead of Mr. Or Miss. I know people are like, Oh, MX that's new. It's like, no, these, these people in the seventies were playing around with it, which is very cool to me. Um, but all that, is, all that said, the book, uh, is about how it, it sort of classifies people. There's the men and there's the women. And then there's the character, the, the group that is called the, the F words, but it's the F words and their friends. And so it makes it very clear that nobody just by virtue of being straight or by virtue of being queer is good or bad or, or anything. Because, you know, it's it's the it's the queer people, but it's also their friends who are are, you know, straight people or or people who aren't sure or, or anyone who want to believe in a more radical existence, who want to believe in a magical world. And I think that's really important that when you were talking about, you know, like um, you and I have different experiences. And I think that's, you know, it's it's so important to think about you know, I, I talk a lot about, you know, queer experience and queer experience with the paranormal, but I, you know, it's, it's really important to me to say that, like, that doesn't mean that it's like, oh, this is just out, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's no. not, it's, it's everybody's it's, it's the friends, you know, everyone, everyone, you know, when I, when I said before that I think community is the only thing that can save us, I really meant that. And community is made of individuals binding themselves together into something bigger and stronger and, and, and more powerful. And I think, you know, a lot of times the word community gets used in, I think a lot of times the word community gets used sort of um, in the same place where what people really mean is demographic. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. You know, I think about, I think about like the, like the trans community is something people say a lot. And it's like, 
I don't think that I'm in the same community as Caitlyn Jenner. You know, I think that Caitlyn Jenner, by virtue of class and race, is in a very different community than I am. I don't think people will say like the Asian community. I don't think that I'm in the same community as Andrew Yang, because, again, (laughs) uh, class and uh, political alignment, I, I think that we are in different communities. And so when I think about community, I'm thinking about individual relationships that are connected to other individual relationships that connect, that build into something really meaningful. Um, all of that, again, all of that to say that, you know, this, this, uh, this idea of queer people and their friends, that's, you know, that's sort of, that's, that's allyship, right? Like that's, that is, I think people, people misuse allyship a lot too. I think allyship is a word that people are often like, yes, I'm an ally. I personally wouldn't do a hate crime. And it's like, that's great. That's not <laughs> that's, the bar for it. <laughs> the abs- the absence of doing something does not make you. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I, you know, I think, I think, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, I think that it, you know, I think that there's a it's it's easy for some people to say like I want a diverse group of voices and that means only people who aren't white and I think that there are you know or people who aren't straight and while I think that you know the representation is crucial and I you know I I, I love to see lots of voices pop up that are not the voices I've seen on television um, you know I would love to see a ghost hunting show that's not you know for uh members of a you know trapped cover band (sighs) um but i also think you know i'm I'm thinking about every time you know every time you've talked to me about the stuff that you're investigating or things you're looking into it's always like yeah that's fucking interesting that's cool you know (laughs) like like i i i think i think the the friends part of the f words and friends is 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 very important too is the the roundabout i get on these ryan i get on these tangents and i just start talking about one thing and it leads me well to that's uh, stuff. thank god we're doing a podcast <laughs> <laughs> i you know it is and at the end of the day too i think something that is important to remember and you know for everybody is you know there are these big because i always love the I love the deep end and I love the shallow end of the pool. I love the whole pool. Totally. Right. Yep. And so when it comes to the paranormal, you know, we're in the, we're really in the deep end over here. Um, but, and it's important to go into the deep end every once in a while. Cause then you remember like, Oh, I don't have my footing. And yeah. um, so it's important for me. Uh, and I think it's important for everybody to go into the deep end. And, but at the same time, I love being over in the shallow end. Cause that's where, you know, you can shoot hoops or do everything and just totally. splash around and have some fun. And <laughs> the paranormal and investigating the paranormal should also be splashing around and, and, you know, and having fun or, you know, why are we doing it? Absolutely. I, I, I am trying to, I am trying to live a life that is fun and it's, you know, that doesn't mean not focusing on some of the important stuff. I focus on a lot of important stuff. That's why my back hurts all the time. But, uh, I, I, if I'm going to do anything, I want it to be fun. You know, I think I'm trying to, I keep saying this. I am trying to, you know, I'm, I'm 32. I'm going to be 33 in, uh, 16 days. That's fun. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to be 33 in 16 days. And at this point, I, you know, I've spent, I spent 10 years touring, doing stand up comedy. And I'm at a point with that where I love performing. I love performing the stand up. I love, uh, you know, I love doing shows. It's great. But in terms of like a comedy career, in terms of like working clubs and trying to get on TV, that is a, that is a thing that has become, less and less important to me the more I've gone on. And it's, it's both a combination. It's mostly just the, sort of the, the culture of, of what that means. And I, I see the people who are, who are working really hard to do that. And I see sort of what sorts of uh, personal and, uh, and moral sacrifices that often requires. And I, you know, I, 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 I will, I will perform for, you know, until, until I can't, you know, I'll be doing, I will perform at probably conventions and, and different things, but I'm, you know, I'm not working as like, I'm not trying to be a club comic anymore. Um, because it's not being fun. 
and I think I want to I want to do things that are fun. I want to make cool art with my weird friends. And that's just sort of that's my big goal right now. <laughs> you know, it's just make cool art with my weird friends. And uh, and I and I want to do that because it's fun. So I'm I'm very I'm very with you on that. Yeah, I mean, that's I mean, that is a, uh, you know, a in both ways, I mean, this word is a radical and a radical way to live one's life uh, is to, you know, make these choices for ourselves, regardless of, you know, the preconceived notions that maybe we thought about. Oh, yeah. but what will people think if I stop doing this? I mean, because I, you know, I that thought, you know, when you talk about stand up comedy specifically, it's you know, my career is in a much different place than I thought it would be 20 years ago when I was totally. doing open mics. And, but I agree with you, you know, I think what we see now in, as like the dominant, like popular thing in stand up, I think uh, is much different than it was 10 years ago. And totally. it used to be very like 10 years ago when I first got to Los Angeles, it was very kind of alt centric was getting a lot yeah. of the attention. Now I feel like the pendulum has swung to the opposite end of uh, end of that and you know it'll hopefully it'll swing into the weird not swing back but swing in a different <laughs> direction to the weird yeah. which which i think it will at some point but but when it comes to the paranormal as well you know it, it does have to be fun but i think part of the fun and i think well a large part of the fun for me is the bigger the bigger thing that adds meaning to the fun and yeah. that's why it's so fun uh because i totally. think fun is kind of a, a restrictive word in this way i mean it's like it's almost it's exciting yeah uh, which is excitement and excited enjoyment right and for me that's what i feel when you're talking about the breadcrumbs that are leading you down a yeah. path you were not expecting and it's those moments and it's the work that goes into even being able to discover those breadcrumbs after the fact where you didn't realize it was a breadcrumb when it happened absolutely and that's some, that's some of the most fun ones where you're like yeah oh that's been from the start there this has been piling <laughs> up this this thing has been building itself into a tower behind me. And I turn around and I'm like, okay, I see now. Yeah. I see, yeah. <laughs> I, I see, I see what this is. Yeah. I mean, like the, this whole idea, I mean, I've never been more convinced in my life that there is no such thing as linear time and the paranormal. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think like, oh, I just started this investigation on post down. Little did I know it started two years before and I didn't even realize yeah. it. Um, yep. Because of things that are I happening. Had, buddy, I had the, the, did I tell you, have I told you, about, I've, I've told you about the, the calls, the calls that I've been getting for like seven years of my life. Well, do you want to, do you want to lay it on everybody right now? I think we should real yeah. quick. We'll, 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 and we'll end it with this because I do, I, I would like to be reminded of this though. So for, I'm going to say seven, eight years, I have been getting wrong number calls for one name, one name specifically, the calls are always from the San Francisco Bay Area. And I've been getting calls and I was just like, all right, there's just like some old dude who has a similar phone number to mine who who puts the number down. And this is like before this is back when I was like, oh, yeah, paranormal stuff is cool, but I don't really know anything about it. You know, I was I hadn't done research. I hadn't looked into things, even a fraction that I that I have now. And I, I'm getting these calls for a name and that name is Robert Graves. And I don't think too much of it. I think I Googled it and I couldn't find anything. And I, I'm not thinking too much about it. It just happens. It happens. I get them like a couple of times a week and, um, but it's nothing, you know, something, something like that happens. And eventually when it happens enough, you just sort of, it just, you drown it out. It just becomes like white noise. Basically. I'm talking to a friend of mine who is like, who is a practitioner who like leads a coven of, um, you know, one of those, one of the, the mystery, one of the mystery religions, one of the mystery cults. And they're recommending me comic books. Now we're not even talking paranormal stuff. I'm just talking about gods that I like. And they're like, Oh yeah, you got to check out uh, the wicked plus the divine. Like, it's really fun. It's about gods and stuff. And I'm like, great, let me check it out. 
and I, I get this book and I start looking into it and someone in the book, I think the second trade is like, Oh, something, something I was there. I wrote the, I, I inspired the white witch and someone's like the white witch, you mean Robert Graves. And I have this like glass shatters moment of like, what the fuck are you? Fu- fuck. No, come on, come on. And I reach out to that friend and I'm like, Hey, do you know this name? And they're like, well, yeah, I wouldn't be much of a neo-pagan if I didn't. And that sends me down this rabbit hole. And I find out that Robert Graves has is the name of a dude who was like so deeply tied to everything that is like organized neo-paganism now, like a cornerstone of the shit. And all, and it's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me to connect this person who I know through magic stuff, through witch stuff, is now bringing is now connecting to this wrong number call that I've been getting literally at points every day, but usually like you know two or three times a week for like seven or eight years, and then some. This 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 one I will I will save the specifics, but it then connected to a very specific part of the show and the cinematographer I worked with started getting synchronicities and that tied us to a location, a whole big thing. That said, that's one where like, as you know, you talked to me two years ago and I'm like, Oh yeah. Robert Graves. That's that number that I always get. Like, that's just some dude. And now it's like, all right, well, yeah, it, it is just some dude, but it has all of these ties to, you know, magic, the foundation of neo-paganism today and that's fucking bananas it is really bananas because they're calling looking for robert graves yeah which leads you uh, yeah and which leads you to finding robert graves in a way that is so synchronistic it it just and that whole this because to me it, it it's so profound because it starts so long before yeah which just amps up the intensity in a way that is that is one of those wow exciting holy and sure other people who are skeptic could come in and be like that is just such a coincidence and it's like fine you go live that boring life with your telescope posters on your wall (laughs) Daydream about uh, your favorite number, which, by the way, numbers are magical, and I love numbers. I'm not trying to shit on people who love numbers, no, but numbers. but I think we and get my, the point. And you know, tel- telescopes, microscopes, also magical. yeah, also, <laughs> but, but yeah, you- <laughs> but we get it. We, we yeah. it's like, come on, really? Yeah. Like this is that is a really awesome, really cool thing. And I think obviously once this is a thing that people can consume in any way possible we will be alerting people here on the on the show about oh yeah no i'm gonna once once the stuff is out and also like you know once the stuff is out i'll go into all of the details that are bananas happily you know with you on this podcast i'm just i'm saving i'm saving a little bit for when the thing for when the thing is is released because i think i think people are gonna i will i will say um I will say, you know, one of the one of the the coolest parts to me about when I first consumed, you know, a piece of media like Hellier, when I watched Hellier, all of the little synchronicities that connected to my life in a in a in a weird specific way, whether it was, you know, a video game randomly randomly generating a town picking Pikeville um Pikeville, Kentucky, whether it is me having a tattoo of a little tin can on my body that I got before I even knew Hellier was anything. I think I got it like seven or eight years ago, maybe six, no, six years ago, six years ago. And it's, but this is a tattoo that was a David Bowie reference because of, uh, because of space oddity, thinking about being lost in space and space travel and all this stuff. Anyway, so with all the little synchronicities and one of the things for me that I think is the most exciting as I, as I get my show edited, as it gets closer to being something people can watch is I am so deeply, deeply excited for people to watch this thing that I made and have weird shit like that start happening for them, you know? Yeah, that's that's the thing. Where it's contagious. Yeah, it is really contagious in uh, in a really really fun way. As as long as you're, I mean, if you're open to it, uh, yeah, for sure. And 
Well, this has been a treat. Let's let's let everybody know where they can get all things Dash. Yeah, so I'm I'm uh, I'm on Twitter mostly at Dash Kwiatkowski. Um, I've been un- unfollowed twice today for being celebratory about the poor health of the Queen of England. So get in while get, get in while it's hot. Uh, <laughs> uh, if if she holds out three days to die, she will die on nine eleven, which is the funniest possible thing. So that's fingers crossed. Uh, I'm on, yeah, I'm on Twitter, Dash Wiekowski. I have a psychic, uh, uh, sort of a tongue in cheek psychic advice podcast called Psychic Friends. The friends is spelled with a Z at the end, uh, where me and my friend Rosa give psychic advice, uh, to the people on Facebook and Facebook groups where they are requesting free psychic advice. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's sort of the, those are the big ones. Awesome. Well, this has been great. This has been fun enjoyable as always so thanks for being here and if i can get this paranormal storytelling show that is not stand-up comedy yeah uh off the ground i don't know if i'll have enough time to actually book the proper tour but you know i you and i have already discussed you know trying to you know do this show together i think it would be really fun to to have you on the show as well so you know obviously i'll be letting people know about that if if uh well when that comes together whether it's before the end of this year or not is the question but definitely something that's happening in in the near future so looking forward to that you let me know i'm 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 100 percent on board i'm so excited uh i'm excited both to do fun uh travel sort of storytelling and comedy and stuff with you but also just excited to hang out yeah it's been too long hanging out with you it's it's been been a real long time yeah yeah Yeah, so thank you thank you I was going to say, thanks for having me on the show. I had, I had so much fun. Yeah, of course. Of course. And uh, love love you. Great chat. And uh, we'll do it again soon. Love you too, bud. Yeah, this was great.